Hello and a very warm welcome to you as we continue this series on First John. There's times when people say to somebody like myself, well you're a religious person and of course I understand what they mean by that but I don't define myself as a religious person. I'm somebody who is in a relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And so yes, a religious person is, is defined as somebody who has a set of beliefs, a system of beliefs and doctrines and so forth. And of course we have those as Christians. But that is what the heart of Christianity is truly about. It's about a relationship with God made possible through his son Jesus Christ. And I want to give you three things in this message today. Christians know who Christ is. A Christian knows what Christ has done. And Christians do what Christ commands. Quite a simple set of instructions there. We know who Christ is. We know what he has done for us. And we do what he has commanded us to do. One of the things Jesus said was that a mark of those who follow him would be that they would hear his voice, they would know his voice, and they would recognise him. That means that he does speak to us today as Christians. I remember once when I was a very young man, very new to the Christian life, and there was this man who was a chef on board this ship I was serving on, and he was quite ill, and one day he was telling me and some others about his illness and I felt the urging of the Holy Spirit pray for him right here and now lay hands on him and pray for him and I talked myself out of doing that all of the reasons that came up in my mind and I always regretted that and I left that ship soon afterwards and and I apologized to the Lord I said Lord I said forgive me for not doing what you told me to do at that time and I made a decision that if I truly felt the Holy Spirit was leading me to say something to somebody or to do something, that I would obey without hesitation. And there have been times in my life when that has happened. Not long after that incident I told you about, I was on this other ship and there was this man on there who nobody particularly liked. I'm not sure what the reasons were, just his manner and his character. Um, people didn't particularly like this person. And quite often he would be sitting alone at the dinner table in the mess room with nobody else sitting near him because they didn't want to speak to him. And one day I went into the dining room, I got my meal, and I really felt the presence of the Lord just come upon me and I felt an absolutely overwhelming love for this man. I knew it was the love that God had for him. And I just sensed that God wanted me to tell him that. So I went and sat down next to him or opposite him. And I said to him, God loves you. God loves you very much and he wants you to know that. And the man just looked at me with a very curious look and he didn't say anything. And I just started talking about my faith as a Christian and saying that I really believed that God had a love for him. I finished my meal. The man hadn't particularly said anything. I went away. And later on on that day on that ship, he called me aside when we bumped into each other. And he said, Sean, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I used to go to church and there was a different number of reasons or things that happened in his life why he stopped going. And he said, just recently, I've been really thinking that I would like to get back into church and I'd really like to have my faith refreshed. He said, but there was one question that was bothering me. He said, I've been absent from church for so long. And he said, this morning, and he said, and I've been asking God it recently. He said, but this morning I prayed to God and says, God, do you still love me? Do you love me, Lord? Isn't it wonderful when we as God's people are in the right place at the right time? And just imagine if I hadn't, I have obeyed doing what the Lord had told me to do, what I sensed he wanted me to say to that man. And to him, it was very much a, a mark and a sign that God still loved him and that the Lord was calling him to come back into the fellowship in the community of faith. There was uh, another time when I was in this, visiting this town, just shopping with my family, my wife and children. And there was this woman in this store, it's one of these big clothes department stores. 
And I just felt the Holy Spirit, because sometimes, you know, the Lord just unexpectedly will tell us things and say things to us. And I felt the Lord say to me, tell that woman it's under the fridge. And I looked and there was this elderly lady and my mind started to try to talk myself out of it. And I thought, no, I'm going to do it. Whatever the consequences, she might think I'm a madman or whatever, but I just went up to her. I said, excuse me, madam. I've got a message for you. It's under the fridge. And that's all I said. I didn't say God has spoken to me, God had told me or anything. I just said, it's under the fridge. And she looked at me and she said, can I have your telephone number? And I said, well, of course. So I just, without thinking, she wrote it down. Anyway, went away, went back home and I had a telephone call that evening. And the lady said, how did you know? And I'd forgotten about it, really. I said, well, how did I know what? She said, you told me it's under the fridge. I said, oh, yes. I said, you're the lady I spoke to in that shop this afternoon. She said, I lost my wedding ring. She said, my husband died several years ago, and I lost my wedding ring. She says, the only time I take it off is if I'm cooking or gardening. And she said, I've been making some cakes that week and I've been, you know, kneading the flour, the dough and so forth. And she said, I just could not find my wedding ring. And she said, I was so upset. And she said, I've been praying to God. She said, I'm not particularly a, a religious person, but she said, I've been praying to God. She says, God, will you please help me find my wedding ring? And when you said to me today, it's under the fridge, she said, I went home, I called my son and he came around and he moved the fridge and my wedding ring was under there. And she said, who are you and how did you know? And of course, I was able to tell her. I said, well, I'm a Christian minister. And I just felt that the Holy Spirit just put that on my heart to say to you, it's under the fridge. And she was absolutely ecstatic and delighted. And it really made her start to think about the reality of spiritual issues. You see, a Christian knows who Christ is. A Christian knows what Christ has done for them. And a Christian does what Christ has commanded. So far, so far we have looked at how God's is love, is light, and is forgiven as we looked at this series and today we're going to look at um, we know who Christ is we know what Christ has done and that Christians do what Christ commands you see there are stages in the physical life we all know that when we are born when we start to grow when we mature when we become older and so forth there's also stages in the spiritual life that's why in the text, which we're going to read in a short while, we see that John refers to the congregation as dear children. Then he speaks to the, um, the fathers and the young men, figuratively speaking. He's talking to all of the um, adults. But there are stages in the spiritual life. And we've seen so far in this series how we know that we are not going to be perfect in this life as Christians. There will be times when we stumble. There will be times when we make mistakes. I told you about a sin of omission that I committed when I was a young Christian. You're not doing what the Lord had told me to do. John Newton, the former slave trading captain of a slave ship who became a minister of the gospel, he expressed it very helpfully when he said this about his life. I am not what I ought to be, but I am not what I once was. And it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. So I want to encourage you today that you can know Christ and you can understand exactly what it is that he has done for you. You can understand what he has done. And then as you look at his word, you look at the scriptures, and as you follow him with the presence of the Holy Spirit, you will start to discover what it is that he wants you to do. You see, Jesus may be your saviour, but he also needs to be lord of your life. And that takes a, a willing and willful submission of ourselves to him, that when we understand that he's our saviour, that we also allow him to be lord of our life, which means that we do what he tells us 
to do. So I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And so as we look at verses 1 and 2, remember, we can know who Christ is, not just as a, a historical figure, but we can know him in our lives now. It's about relationship, not about religion. We can prove that Jesus was a figure of history using the process called textual criticism. There's more evidence of Jesus being an historical person than there is even of Julius Caesar and many other historical characters. But Christ is different in the sense that we can still know him Today, we can enter into a relationship with him. And isn't it wonderful that when we do sin or when we do stumble, that Jesus has our back. He's on our side. He intercedes for us and prays to us with the Father and says, Lord, I've taken that sin. I've paid the price for that. And we are forgiven and we are cleansed by his precious blood. But remember, that does not mean that we can just live how we want to live. We can know who Christ is, we can know what what Christ has done, but we must also do what Christ commands us to do, because that is what it means to walk in the light and to walk in love. As Jesus said, if anyone loves me, they will obey me and do what I have commanded them to do. So remember that Christ is on your side, the one who is sinless. That is why he can speak to the Father in our defence. He calls us to be on his side in this world, in the battle of light and darkness. And he calls us to be those who bear witness to the reality of the relationship that we have with him. And if we sin and make mistakes, he's paid the price for it. His sinless life was given for us and it's through him that forgiveness is given. And anyone can come to him. That verse is not talking about universal salvation. But the message of the gospel is going out into the world. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him and comes comes to him will have eternal life. And a true Christian does not make claims about being perfect. But they do seek to walk in obedience, to walk in the light as he is in the light. And when we do make mistakes, we confess our sins. And we don't deny that we have sins. We're not perfect is something that John is wanting to us to acknowledge. So Christians know who Christ is. A Christian knows what Christ has done, what his work on the cross means. And the Christian 
is somebody who should be doing what Christ has commanded. Because remember, he can be your saviour, but you need to make him your Lord as well. In verses 3 to 6, a word that John frequently uses is the word no, ginosko. It denotes a knowledge that comes by experience. We learn from John that the key to knowing that we have fellowship with Jesus Christ is understanding the difference between talking and walking. God is not impressed by what we'll say we will do. He's only impressed by what we do. So many people talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. If you say you trust the Lord, well, where's the evidence in your life? When he tells you to do something which has risk or tell you to do something which takes you out of your comfort zone, do you obey him? Do you trust him? Or do you walk in fear? Do you walk in doubt, thinking that he may let you down? There's a huge difference between talking and walking. You keep his commandments and you walk just as he walked. And remember, Jesus did everything that God had told him to do. And wouldn't that be wonderful if we were like that as Christians, if we understood what it was God called us to do and we just did it, trusting him at all times. So earlier in this letter, we learned that denial of sin, if we are in denial of sin, that truth is absent. But also, if we have a denial of obedience, it means the same thing, that truth is absent. When somebody genuinely comes to know Christ, there is a genuine desire to seek to do his will, to seek to follow him, to seek to walk with him, to seek to serve him. God's love inspires our love for him. We see later on in the letter, we love because he first loved us. So many people struggle with that concept, especially those who are new to the faith. And sometimes people have it throughout their Christian life, that question, does God truly love me? It's important that we have that question settled. And if we can honestly say with our hearts, well, I do love the Lord, it's because he loves us. You say, well, how do I know if I love the Lord? Well, are you walking in obedience to him? You see, if you're not, you can't say that you love the Lord and then don't do anything for him. The more we know him, the more we want to obey his commands. And by obeying God's word, his love is made complete in us. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And remember, their sins are commission, those things that we do. But there's also sins of omission, the things we do not do that we should do. But John holds up the earthly life of Jesus as somebody to imitate. And some people are afraid to, to follow him. But let me tell you this. The life of faith is an absolute adventure. To the outsider, somebody living a religious life, it may appear very boring to them. My goodness, they go along to that church. They live by this set of rules and doctrines and teachings, but they've misunderstood what the Christian life is truly about. It's about relationship, not about religion. And the life of faith, when you're in a relationship with the Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit is in your life, the life of faith is an absolute adventure. There will be tough times, don't get me wrong. We are in a spiritual battleground in this world, not a playground. But the fact is, I can say, I know him. I know what Christ has done for me. And I am doing what he has commanded me to do with my life in preaching the gospel. And the fact is, I can also say to you that he loves you. He's calling you to follow him, to serve him, to live this life of an adventure. And we see here in verses 7 to 8, it's, um, it's an old commandment to love one another. John doesn't write about something totally new to them. 
They understood the Ten Commandments were about loving God, loving yourself, and doing what is right by your neighbour. And Jesus summed up the whole of the Old Testament law by saying that's how it is summed up, that you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind and soul, and you love your neighbour as you love yourself. I remember Jesus talked about the golden rule. Do not do to another person what you don't want them to do to you. And isn't that right that we do that as Christians? Sometimes I will sit in a group of ministers and sometimes a minister may say, well, I don't like this person in my church or I don't like that person because they're difficult or they're like this or they're like that. You see, God doesn't call us to like people. He calls us to love people. And that's the difference. And love is an action. As a minister, I have to be honest with you, I've not always liked everybody who's perhaps been a member of the church I've been minister of. But I've always done what is right by that person. Always prayed of them. Showed them the respect and courtesy that I do to all of God's people. If they're in need, I will be there. I will help them. I will assist them. Because that's what it means to love somebody. And that's what it means to walk in the light. There's some awful human beings in this world. But we are to do what is right by them. If they was thirsty, it could be the most awful human being in the world. If they was thirsty, we should give them a cup of water, as Jesus told us to do. And that's what it means to love somebody. It's love in action. So don't confuse liking and loving people. And we are commanded to walk in the light and for Jesus to be our example. The one who, whilst they were crucifying him on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Here in verses 9 to 11, you cannot claim to be walking in the light of God's love and hate a brother or sister in the church. Hate is something that is of the realm of darkness. I can honestly examine my heart and honestly say, I don't think there's any human being in this world whom I hate. I may not like what they do at times. But to hate somebody or something is you want to destroy it, you want to hurt them, you want to damage them. God's love has filled my heart and filled my mind and I want to preach his message of love, of repentance, of forgiveness, of the day of accounting that one day the Bible teaches us will come upon all who have ever lived in this world. And it's so important because as a minister, whenever I stand in front of a congregation of people, I always think and remind myself, myself that each and every person here is somebody whom God loves, is somebody whom Christ has died for. You can't always understand or know what's going on in everybody's lives, but you can know that God loves that person. Jesus died for that person. If they are not a Christian, you can say that he invites you to be a part of the kingdom. He will forgive you. He will come into a relationship with you. If they're a part of the kingdom of God already, you can talk to them about how much he still loves them. And that person can know who Christ is. They can understand fully what Christ has done for them. And they can walk in obedience and do what Christ has called them to do. And I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Isn't that wonderful that we do have the forgiveness of sins on account of his name? And he says, I write to you, fathers, but he's talking about all the adults in the church. He's using figurative language there. And twice he says to them, because you have known him who is from the beginning. That if you like, these elderly people in the church, these elders, they had come to a mature relationship where they knew exactly who it was who they followed. And then he says, I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one and because the word of God lives in you 
and again, and you have overcome the evil one. And that is how we successfully walk and follow the Lord in this life, is by making sure that his word is in us and that it lives within us. So walk with the Lord, walk in his light, walk in his love, and learn to obey him and learn to listen to his voice, that when he says to you to do something, that you can be sure, yes, indeed, my Lord has told me to do that thing. And you will see amazing and great things happen. Because the life of faith, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And the greatest adventure we can have in this spiritual battleground which we live in, that is this world, the greatest adventure we can have is knowing who Christ is, who our Lord is. That he's not just our Saviour, but allowing him to be Lord of our life, knowing what it is he has done, understanding what his death upon the cross means, and then understanding what he has called us to do, the place he would have us serve him in the church which he loves, so that we may together as God's people preach and proclaim the wonderful glorious gospel of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. All of my plans, all of my pride The work of my hands, the shame I can't hide It falls before your throne Hopes that I hold, fears I can't shake Lies I've been told, chains I can't break It falls before your throne I lay it down I lay it down All of my me Brighter blaze, thundering voice, calling my name, Jesus, my joy. I fall before your throne, and I lay it down. I lay.
like to join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, grant renewal to us your people and grant renewal to your whole church. Renewal of love for you and for one another. Renewal of faith in your promises and in the power of the gospel. Renewal of vision for the work of your kingdom throughout the world. Renew our lives, O Christ, after your own image. Renew us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. May the word of God live within us. Make us strong, Lord, for service and witness. Courageous to do the things you call us to do. Renew your church, O God, for mission and service. And make it here and everywhere a living fellowship of the Spirit. Revealing your love to the world. Reconciling men and women to you and each other. And serving all who are in need. For the glory of Christ our Lord. And in his name we say, Amen. Shall we say together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. And may his peace be upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And Amen. <laughs>